baby that she had prepared a home for. And when she was describing her love for him and how much she cared about him, it impacted those defendants who were watching. They seemed to be emotional and people in the gallery were crying. The jurors were still keeping it together. They keep very serious faces and didn't show much reaction, but I did notice that they looked uncomfortable with some of the details. And one woman, her eyes looking like they were tearing up, but they really were attentive to everything that was coming out. And there's more expected ahead in the rest of the week for this trial. Vinny, back to you. All right, Julie Janae in Ohio tonight. Wow. Let's bring in our think tank tonight to talk about some of this emotion. Joining us in New York City in our Court TV studios, criminal defense attorney Matthew Maddox. In studio, criminal defense attorney Barbara Moon, criminal defense attorney Michael Bixon. And there's a pattern here. Criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Ashley McMahon. Great to have you all here. We've got some great, great uh, defense attorneys. Got my work cut out for me. Um, tears from mom. Oh, wait a minute, Barbara. They weren't about baby Dylan. They were about, oh... I'm, I'm, I'm now on a murder trial, and I'm not going to be able to spend time with the love of my life anymore. Well, you could take that as that maybe they were, she was still crying about the baby, but it just happened to be at that point that uh, the emotions uh, rose. So you can not just say it's totally about she and her long-time relationship with her husband. You could also see a genuine side of her, because from what I understand, she has not broken down before this happened. So I think it does show a a different side of her, even though her attorney, for some unknown reason, has already said that well, she... Well, we'll talk about that. It, this is a love story. Uh, and how does this love story play in court? Does this help? The def Remember, the whole defense here, uh, let me remind everyone at home, she's admitted to murder. She will get on the stand and tell the jury what she did. Her attorney will not ask the jury to find her not guilty. He was on the program earlier tonight. He's not going to say that. The whole case is about her saying... He's innocent, okay? That's what this is about. So the fact they're sitting next to each other at the same table in the courtroom, love story, cries when she hears stories about their love, how, how does that impact what this jury's going to do? It can both help and it can hurt. On one hand, it helps because it shows that human side of her that, you know, that these are people, that they have this loving relationship. On the other side, if she gets up there and she testifies... It she is testifying. Well, I know, but it, it can potentially hurt because now they're saying, well, is she just saying this just to get him off because she cares and she loves for him? And so it calls into question the testimony itself. But on the other hand, like I said, it can help too. There, there's two sides to it, I think. See, I, what I think is going to happen is I think Daniel, in this case, is guilty. He's guilty of turning a blind eye to his wife's addiction problems. He's been with her for 20 years. And I think this is the tragic result of him not being able to get help for Jessica time after time again. And I think if you get, unfortunately, this is a common story for a lot of Americans. I mean, we've got an opiate addiction in this problem in this country. And if you get one juror, just one juror, sitting back there deliberating, who's saying, I have a loved one who is addicted to heroin, who is addicted to methamphetamines, who is addicted to some sort of substance, and something horrible happened or something horrible didn't happen, and I would have done anything for that person, I think they acquit Daniel. All right. Uh, Mike, uh, Matthew, what's more powerful inside this courtroom? Is it this incredible love story about these two people who... Um, during, uh, before the jury got in the courtroom, we're holding hands in, in the courtroom, sitting next to each other, passing notes back and forth during the trial, this incredible love story, or baby Dylan 30 feet down in the bottom of a well. There's no question. The, the compelling story is this child who, who died, who was murdered apparently, and thrown to the bottom of the well. Um, you know, you, you've, got a, you've got a tiny infant the victim of uh, apparently a horrible, maybe grisly death, jettisoned down the bottom of a well. And the contrast with, you know, this idea of a love story and holding hands, to me, the optics are really, really bad. I want you to take a listen to Andrea Bowling. Who is she? She's the foster mother of baby Dylan. And when she was crying in court today, it was about baby Dylan. Um, you mentioned before that uh, you were advised that uh, uh, that uh, baby Dylan may have some um, 
some symptoms associated with, with drug withdrawal? Yes. Okay. Um, did, you, did you observe any of these symptoms while he was in your care? Yes. What did you observe? He had tremors or his arms would shake. Okay. And his legs would jerk. <laughs> he had sweats. And he liked to be held at all times when he wasn't asleep or in his mama room. I was holding him. Ashley, I got to ask you because you mentioned the whole drug addiction. And that's real. I understand that's real. This foster mom, when she handed that baby back, it was emotional for her. She wrote this letter. She was there. All they had to do was pick up a phone, send her a text. She would have been there. She would have taken care of that child. I can't imagine. I can't imagine what this woman is feeling right now. I mean, having to hold uh, this child. But she was a lifeline for Dylan. If they just, Absolutely. if they picked up the phone or texted or did anything, she would have been there. Absolutely. And here's the thing about addiction. We don't know how much Jessica may have been hiding from Daniel in this situation. I mean, people, res addicts respond differently to different things. And I have no doubt that regardless of whether or not Jessica thought it t in her own mind, if she was a fit mother, I have no doubt that she wanted her baby back with her, even if it wasn't the right thing for baby Dylan. And unfortunately, that's how this ended. All right, folks, when we come back, I, I told you at the top that the attorney, uh, for uh, Jessica, the mother, has already said she murdered the baby. But today, he went after a CPS worker, Child Protective Services. Intense cross-examination. We'll take a look at that next. 20 years ago, millions worldwide discovered a fitness phenomenon, the Abdoer. Now meet the next generation, Abdoer 360. It combines an abdominal and muscle activating workout with aerobics to burn calories and work muscles simultaneously. It's really great to get that cardio workout in while you're also sculpting your muscles. The secret is the patented core support column that works the major muscles of your midsection. It features breakthrough innovations like the dynamic fluidity seat that engages your abdominal core and burns calories. I got on that machine the first day and went, this is going to do the job. In fact, research shows the Abdoer 360 activates the same muscles as the gold standard crunch, but off the floor in padded comfort. Now it's your turn. The next generation Abdoer 360 fitness system from Thane. To get yours now, go online at abdoer360.com or visit these fine online retailers. Hi. I'm Hanno. I created Gabi because most people overpay on car insurance. Gabi is a free tool that saves you money by finding the best deal. Gabi users save more than $800 per year on average. Go to Gabi.com and stop overpaying for car insurance. If you owe $10,000 or more to the IRS or state, this may be the most important phone call you'll ever make. I owed $87,000 in taxes. But listen. Your tax problem is settled. You only owe $3,500. What a great message. I owed $11,000 on my taxes, but now... Congratulations, you only owe $2,068. How's that sound? If you owe $10,000 or more to the IRS or state, then you owe it to yourself to call this number or go to tax10,000.com. Even if you are already at the point where you're struggling with levies and garnishments, let our experts help guide you through the process of negotiating a tax settlement. We owe the IRS $48,000. But check out what we actually paid. Are you sitting down? You only owe $3,571. Call 800-231-1409 or go to tax10,000.com. That's 800-231-1409. Best Fiend, it's more than a game. Collect tons of cute characters. Solve thousands of fiendishly fun puzzles. Download Best Fiends for free today. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. We got one of those new purple mattresses, and it is amazing. You have to try it. You didn't need to... Shh. Just lie down. Oh, this doesn't feel like memory foam. No. This feels amazing. Right? What is it? Actually, it's called purple. And it's nothing like memory foam. It's a totally unique gel grid technology meticulously designed to cradle and support the human body. It sleeps cool, it's motion isolating, and honestly, I love it more than two of my three children. Cool.
We loved our purple so much, we got one for the guest bedroom. That way, yeah. when my in-laws come, they yeah. can stay in my bed and I can start. Okay, feel that? Adapts instantly. Now. Honey! Oh, hey, honey. Yeah, um, so just uh, showing the guys the, uh, the new purple mattress. Take advantage of Purple Snore and 20 Cent and get free purple sheets and a premium sleep mask when you buy any purple mattress. Get yours today at purple.com slash TV. Yeah, did you just walk in and have a seat on the couch? At first, but before I left, I got up, walked over, looked at him. I made three state, uh, two statements. I made, I wonder if he's going to have natural curly hair like his dad and brother. He has the prettiest blue eyes for a baby. And I touched the bottom of his foot and he grinned. Patricia Kraft, you know that's not a true statement, that you did none of that, Objection. that you merely glanced at Dylan and did not actually observe him, did you? Objection sustained. Rephrase your question. Make a question, not a statement. But you did not hold him. No. You did not pick him up. No. Isn't it true that you merely glanced at him? I, I looked at him from uh, sitting on the couch. From sitting on the couch? Yes. I'm right here and Jessica was right here. So you came in the house, sat down on the couch, didn't view Dylan at all, and the only time you looked at him was from the couch. When I seen Jessica with Jessica. Okay. So you didn't even go over to him and look and take a look at him? No. Okay. This is Kraft. Do you think you did your job to the best of your ability? Yes. I did it within the law. The what? only thing I didn't do was bust the door down to find that baby. That is Sean Stratton, the defense attorney for Jessica Groves, the mother of baby Dylan. He was on the program earlier tonight, and we went through all of this. And his side of the story to, to all of this, number one, is he wants to get to the truth. He wants to, His client wants the truth to be told. And they say the truth is dad had nothing to do with it. Mom is the one who committed the murder. And CPS should be outed because they're not doing their jobs either. They dropped the ball. So... How will that play with this jury? Matthew Maddox, great criminal defense attorney, joining us in New York. You, you are basically telling the jury your client is guilty of murder, but you're still attacking CPS. Is the jury going to believe you when you say now the father is innocent? I think that the strategy of making CTS an accomplice is probably the only remaining strategy for the defense in this instance. Um, you know, I, I think people are prone to suspect state agencies and civil servants. Um, and so I think, it's, I think it's the only fertile ground for this lawyer to plow in order to try to provide more color and another kind of insinuated story into this trial. All right, let me ask you, from my perspective, right, and I'm a former prosecutor, so I don't, you know, I don't do all this great work that you guys do uh, for criminal defendants across the country. But if he's trying to prosecute his own client and trying to convince his jury that the father is innocent, isn't the best road to there just focusing on the guilt of your own client rather than trying to point guilt somewhere else as well? I would think so after his opening statement, because he's clearly said that's the route they're going to try to protect the father. And I think the way he is so aggressively, violently attacking uh, this witness that the juror could hold it against him. Because it's like blaming, you're saying your client's guilty of murder, and he says the word murder. He says murder, murder. absolutely. He doesn't say uh, the death of the child, which would make it put a little lighter tone to it. He says she's guilty of murder. And those are strong words. And then by the same token, I mean, his look, his uh, aggressive manner and style toward the... Yeah, it was a tense moment no, inside tense. that courtroom today. It's, it's very really tense. tense. Very. So if, 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 you're, if the whole strategy... And he said exactly, he told us on the air tonight, the whole strategy of the case, it's, it's, they're trying the case together. The whole point is to convince this jury that dad is innocent. Why are we going after CPS? You've got me. I think there's a time and a place, and this is neither. Yeah. I think it's just the wrong person to go after. I think it makes your client look bad to put it on them, and not to say that they're not negligent, but to put the actual murder on them. Because in all actuality, what did they do? They turned the child back over. They didn't monitor enough. But that doesn't mean that they murdered the baby. 
right? The actual, I mean, negligence is certainly very different from actual criminal liability. There's two different things. And not to say they're not negligent, but to hammer them on the stand like that, because who did they turn the baby over? To the parents, right? right? And so, in a not just the, no, no, turn the baby over to the father. Yeah, exactly. mom. Mom did not have custody of that child because mom was a, a mess. Mom had the the opioid problem, had the drug problem. Dad is the one with the clean um, drug test. But wow, Vinny. I mean, if looks could kill, oh yeah, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, that CPS worker uh, you know, would be the victim in this case, and that attorney would be on the stand. I mean, wow, just the. Uh, the look he was giving her the entire time he was questioning her, and basically when he said, that's a lie, I was like, I personally, if I was sitting there and I was a juror, I would have moved back in my seat. It was that scary. It was very offensive, his and whole style and demeanor. Matthew, um, from your perspective, or, or from your experience, have you ever, yourself or a colleague, or been in a courtroom where the attorney for a murder defendant has told the jury that the client is guilty of murder. I've never done that. I've never heard of a, of a, a lawyer doing that. And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm hugely intrigued by where he's going with this examination of the CTS work and being so aggressive. I'm very intrigued by, I mean, if, he, if, there, if, if his if his objective and, their, and his mission is to reveal the truth, and he's the guy who's going to make sure that the truth is told here, um, is he trying to develop a narrative where CTS and others uh, are, were similarly kind of clueless? Is that what he's after, to show that, that of course, the, the dad didn't know? Uh, because even these, even these Officials didn't know any better. I'm not sure where he's going, but certainly no. I've never seen anything like that where you come right out and say, yeah, my client committed murder. Anyone here? Never. Never. No, never. you never. think you've seen it all, close. but yeah. then this happens, <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and I asked him, why not just plead guilty, right? right? And then testify and get called yeah. by the defense. But the strategy is for them to be together, right. sitting at that table, for them to be actively a part of this and actively attempting to convince this jury. So you have basically three people prosecuting the mother now. You've got the prosecutor, you've got the father's attorney, and you've got the mother's attorney all prosecuting the mother. So the reason for not pleading guilty and not having her testify... They believe they have a better chance of him being found not guilty if she is here at trial and the jury can see her every day. It's for the optics? It's the for the optics. Optics, and she's going to testify, and... Another lawyer is in the court making the arguments that she's guilty and he's not. But he could have her risk. testify if she pled guilty. But then only one attorney's is. making the well, argument. Not just now we've got two attorneys saying, saying that he's innocent. But it's whether or not they're gonna also going to find her um, guilty of murder or are we talking aggravated murder? And there's a difference between the, between the two. So what the jury finds, I mean, if they put up enough evidence, enough mitigating factors, there's a possibility the jurors might not go for the aggravated murder. And that's a very big difference against, between against her. Exactly. I, 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 yeah. I, it's, it's a long shot, but it's yeah. certainly better than. Did just you hear the part guilty. about the well? The well. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I did. Yeah. But still, it's a chance. So, I, and we're still trying to unravel this case and this strategy, and it's it's clear to me what they're trying to do. I don't think it's ever been done before. No, and it's right. risky. It's, it's very really risky. risky. What's the risk to whom? The, the who's attorney, not, who's well, both of them? The yes. attorney. It, as you know, when clients are in jail, all they have time to do is think. And that may sound good right now for her to say, okay, I'm going to take all the blame. She starts sitting in there and those doors start clinging and there's day after day and they go to the library and start looking up things. So the first thing she's going to do is ineffective assistance of counsel. So it's risky for her looking they're at They're putting the everything on the record, though. Matthew, they're putting everything on the record. And, and, and the judge keeps questioning her, are you sure this is what you want to do? Is, are you sure you want, this is what you want to do? And they, she keeps saying yes, 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 yes. Is there any risk here? Well, there's, there's a, of course, there's, there's always a risk. I mean, as, as counsel's already said, uh, she's absolutely right. Uh, once clients are, are incarcerated and they're serving their time, they have nothing else better to do than to research and see what they can do about ineffective assistance of counsel. What I find just fascinating here, and obviously you do and everybody here is fascinated, you know, we're, 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 we're all adversaries. We're accustomed to an adversarial process. This is supposed to be, this is supposed to be a battle 
um, not only between prosecution and defense, but between two opposed defense attorneys. Imagine what happened behind the scenes here. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm imagining, when was that phone call made to his lawyer? When did her lawyer call his lawyer and say, hey, look, uh, we've got an idea. Uh, I think we're going to, I think we're going to actually, we're going to actually admit that my client committed murder because we want to make sure our only shot, we think, is toward to protect the her the love of her life is for her to fall on her sword through my representation. It's absolutely stunning. All right, how about this though? And it, and this is the thing. And and um, Sean Stratton is told me before his opening statement, his goal in this case for him and his client was justice, the truth. So what if? This is the actual truth. Is, is that still a problem for a criminal defense attorney to be advocating for the truth in a courtroom? No, it's Are not you a just problem. making fun of defense attorneys? To be Was I? No. It's no. Not a problem, no. You almost snuck that one in, Vinny. You almost I mean, did. But problem. is that a problem? But it's a problem the way he did it. I mean, he's calling his client a murderer. If you, if she you, is. You, okay, but you don't call your client that. You don't sit. The, the you don't. Is how, how is that different than you, standing next to your client when they plead guilty? Is it, is it any different? But you can certainly present it in a different way. It's almost like that he is prosecuting his own client. Oh, yes. The way he does this, my client's a murderer. You're going to hear she threw the child down the well. It's horrible facts, and he is putting more emphasis on it the way he's presenting it. So I think the way he's doing it, it, yes, there is a difference when you're sitting next to your client. If if you want justice, you don't put them up, or you just well, she's going to get on, she's going to get up on the witness stand and tell the truth. But you said that's what we said. Well, but you we said don't know what the version the of the truth the, we're going right. to get. The one where she's the murderer. Yeah, again, but there's a difference between what we're talking murder and aggravated murder, and there's different factors between the two. And if he's able to differentiate between the two and show enough, but this is what she's going to do. She's going to get up on the stand and say, "I did it." I killed the baby. I understand that. But My husband it, didn't do anything. Was it premeditated? He's innocent. But she's going to say she killed that baby. She's yeah. not going to say oh, she's gonna I say murder. murdered oh, I think she'll baby. say murder. Oh, I mean, that, that so was the opening statement. I Matthew, I heard it in the opening statement, <laughs> Matthew. I heard it. That, that doesn't murder. He said murder. And, you know, the more I'm listening to all of you and the more I'm, 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 I'm just going through the, how this all developed... You know, look, to, to your original question, is it a problem when a lawyer makes his project, his mission to make sure that the truth is told? Our job is to advocate. Our obligation is to advocate for our client. And what concerns me here is that, you know, this, this lawyer is venturing into, is he writing his own screenplay? Is this TV in his head? Um, you know, this is, this, is, this is a story that's developing that is so far out of the bounds of the roles that counsel is expected to play. We all have a role to play. We Defense has a role to play. Prosecution has a role to play. The judge has a role to play. And this guy is so way far out in another galaxy. Um, it, it just makes me wonder how far away he is from being grounded in any of his obligations. All right. Well, he explained it all right here on Closing Arguments, and I think he'll come back. Um, You've heard a lot from us. Up next, your reaction on social media. How about those tears inside the courtroom from the soon-to-be admitted murderer, baby Dylan's mom? That's next. First big trial of 2020 is New York versus Harvey Weinstein. With 90 accusers, he's ruined so many lives. These charges could put this movie mogul behind bars for life. It's the biggest night on Bounce, featuring appearances by Martin Lawrence, Cedric the Entertainer, Nas, Marseille Martin, and more. All right. The 2020 Bounce Trumpet Award, hosted by Wanda Sykes, premieres Sunday night, 9, 8 central, only on Bounce. We are a force. A tax slaying force. We march forward with a trusted family owned company at our backs. With the right tools at the right price, right at our fingertips. We start free and get our biggest refund possible. Guaranteed. For most of the year, we're everyday people. But right now, we're all tax slayers. And taxes don't stand a chance. Tax Slayer. It's your refund. Go get it. Use Ibotta every time you shop.
you'll earn real cash back on every purchase at over 500,000 stores. Simply pick your offers and go shopping. Then take a picture of your receipt. Download now and get your $20 bonus just for trying the app. Attention parents of children diagnosed with cerebral palsy, Herb's palsy, or another birth injury. If you suspect a medical mistake may have occurred at or near the time of birth, your child may have important legal rights. Call Science & Kirk for a free legal consultation. Cerebral palsy is a permanent disability that may be the result of brain damage suffered during pregnancy, delivery, or shortly after birth. A failure to follow the proper standard of care may be the cause of your child's injury. A lifetime of medical treatment can cost millions of dollars. Protect your family and find out whether financial compensation may be available. Cases are also being investigated for children diagnosed with Herb's palsy, also known as shoulder dystocia or brachial plexus injury. If you suspect your child's disability could have been prevented, obtain a free consultation and case evaluation. Call 1-800-892-9109 for a free consultation. Banking with Chime is very easy. I feel like I can finally trust my bank. There are no monthly fees. I get paid early. I always have peace of mind that my money is in the right place and in good hands. Start banking with Chime today at Chime.com. Non-attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. See disclaimer for law firms. Attention all women who have been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. If you or a loved one used talcum powder for routine feminine hygiene and later suffered from ovarian cancer, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. The use of talc-based powders has been linked to ovarian cancer, and many large manufacturers of talc-based products fail to properly warn women that the use of talcum powder could lead to ovarian cancer. If you were diagnosed with ovarian cancer, or if a loved one even died from ovarian cancer, talcum powder may be to blame. Call right now. You may be owed significant compensation from the manufacturer. Call Nightline Legal to speak with an experienced attorney to determine if you may qualify. If we don't win, there is no fee. There are time deadlines to file a claim, so don't wait. Call right now. 1-800-510-2403. Again, that's 1-800-510-2403. All right, a lot of comments today on social media about baby Dylan's mom, who was in court today and was shedding some tears. So I, I put a little question out there. Why do you think she was shedding all those tears? And we've got reaction, and we begin with our comment of the day, the top comment coming from Mark tonight. And Mark writes, because she got caught and isn't free to do drugs and be selfish every day, the caseworker would have known the kind of people these were if she had bothered to check just one thing of all the things these parents claimed. Job, sick father, appointments, etc. She dropped the ball, and the baby paid the ultimate price. How about that? We've got Mark out there, doesn't like mom at all, but is also blaming CPS here. I definitely, How does that work into the equation here? I definitely think CPS is to blame in this. I mean, I don't like the way that the attorney attacked her on the witness stand, but I certainly don't believe that she comes out completely innocent in all this, especially if, you know, they took the baby, baby Dylan away once and then ended up giving it back to the family. I mean, there was not enough of an investigation done Somebody dropped the ball, and I think CPS is one of those people. Okay. She's definitely negligent in, in not doing her job. But, but, so what, how does that impact this criminal case? Like, I can understand you're going to have an internal review at CPS. We've got to change things. The state's got to uh, step in and figure things out. But how does it affect the criminal case against mom and dad? It's not going to impact, I don't think. That, because, again, we go back to the attorney who said, my client murdered this child. Yes. The, the average social worker may go out and check the house, but they're not thinking, even though they might be a meth addict, that a meth addict is going to take their child, put them in a crate, and throw them down a 30-foot well. There's, there's ways that addicts act, but I haven't heard of another addict acting in that way that you take a baby and throw them down a well. So your average social worker, even though they may be overloaded, underpaid. Well, they, they are. They we are. know they are. We know that. But they're not going to think, okay, this guy's or this mother's got a meth problem. But I don't think if I leave here today, she's going to take the baby and throw it down a 30-foot well. 
All right, Sheila Lee, not Sheila E, but Sheila Lee tonight writing. She's been crying because she is no longer addicted to those horrendous drugs and is able to now feel. Unfortunately, a very young child was murdered by her and her husband. She knows that she has ruined so many lives and now must suffer the consequences of her actions. Very sad. Uh, Matthew, the, the jury sees everything that's happening in the courtroom. What if the jury believes that she's crying now because um, she's crying for herself? I, I think that, you know, again, I think the optics we talked about earlier is a problem here. Look, you, you can't stop a client from displaying emotion sometimes. Um, but, the, you know, the instances, I mean, to the extent that you can strategize with a client and explain, here's what's going to happen, here's how you're going to feel, and you've, you've got to keep yourself in check, um, I think is extremely important. And it's, it's important in this case where you have a, an infant victim. The jury, you know, jurors are smart. In my experience, jurors get it, and they look out, and they see a defendant, and they see a defendant crying, and... I don't think they're looking at her and saying, geez, this poor woman, she's finally off of drugs and you know, she's, she's, she's mourning the, the death of this child. She's mourning what's happened to her family and uh, we really feel compassion for her. I don't think that's happening here. Deborah writing, I noticed a marked shift in her demeanor today towards the various witnesses that could have interceded, almost as if she believes that had they done their jobs properly, she wouldn't be in this predicament. I'm not seeing any accountability on Jessica's part at this point. It's simply said all around accountability. So what does she have to say when she testifies because she is going to testify I hope to she demonstrate doesn't. some accountability? Here. Well, I hope the route that she doesn't go down is putting the blame on them. She needs to take you know, accountability for her own actions. If she goes down the route that her attorney has gone and barks up that tree, it's the wrong tree. She needs to take accountability for her own actions. If she starts you know, putting blame on them, they are going to turn on her in an instant. It's going to destroy her case and any little shred of credibility. And remember, her case, her case is to make sure that her husband is found not guilty. Absolutely. Well, well too, even though she's had this drug addiction, they have an older child, is my understanding, correct? Yeah, so teenager. She, okay, so the teenager, she raised this teenager all this time and didn't throw him down the well. So apparently at some point... I'm not saying she's a great mother, but at some point, whatever drug she had, she was able to contain it enough not to abuse that child. So um, you would hope that you, she would be accountable and say, until I got hooked on meth to this degree, I was capable of raising a child and not causing the child any harm. She needs to own up on this drug addiction and how it impacted her to the degree that she harmed her child. Danielle writing, I think she's just crying because of the position her and her husband are in facing life in prison. I noticed she cried when the caseworker was asked about her observations of Jessica and Danielle's relationship together. I think the crying is for them, not for baby Dylan. I'm so angry at these people for not letting their baby stay with the loving foster mother that would have taken such good care of him. Is there a chance that, again, it comes back to this CPS issue, it, it, and it's, it was super clear to everyone in the courtroom that this foster mother, amazing, mm -hmm. and true love, and truly impacted by this, um, would have taken that baby and kept that baby, Dylan, as long as need be. Absolutely, and that's part of the problem with the, the foster system is that it so favors giving these children back to their biological parents that sometimes, and you know, like uh, Barbara was saying earlier, these uh, CPS workers, they're understaffed, they're underpaid, and the impetus is in the court system to get the child back to their biological parents. As Reunification soon as is always the a, As goal. soon as humanly possible. And watching that fo foster mother breakdown on the stand was absolutely heartbreaking. I have no doubt in my mind that baby Dylan will be alive, healthy, and having a wonderful life today if only he had stayed with that foster parent. And I'm sure that's something she's going to think about every single day. And that and, and, may be where the social worker were there harder on her, on the social worker, by saying, why didn't you leave the child with that foster mother that little Dylan would be Well, they, Again, Dylan that. wasn't left with mom. Dylan was left with dad. Yeah, and, and dad was the one who had the, the clean drug test. At the end of the day, though, there was that lifeline to the foster mom. And, and the part that I want to hear from this mother when she takes a stand is, why wouldn't you just call her, pick up the phone, 
how do you not realize that you are in a really bad place? You're a real family. You've raised another child. You've been a mother. You know what it is. It's not like you're some teenage girl who got pregnant and doesn't understand this whole world. You've been there. You've done it. You've got a teenager. Matthew, I saw you shaking your head. What's on your mind? I just, I, I think her testimony has to be extremely limited. It has to be very narrow. She can't talk about CPS, as counsel's already indicated. She can't, I, I, don't even, I don't even think she can talk about her drug addiction, maybe in a, in a passing way. But if she starts talking about CPS or talking about, you know, I was addicted to drugs, that's why this all happened, that's why uh, I didn't know what was going on. Um, her, her test, her, the whole, the, this whole kind of convoluted, contrived, uh, theory is going to be is, is going to absolutely blow up, you know, and just getting back to this idea of CPS I, I think the defense attorney's approach toward cross-examination was the wrong approach I think the questioning and the content was probably the right content But the demeanor and the tone and the way he went about it was the wrong way and if if he's trying to show that if CPS was out of the loop. If CPS wasn't on this, then how do you expect, under all these circumstances, for this father to have been clued in? And he, if he's trying to isolate this father and and compare the father to CPS, I'm not sure. But his approach is the wrong approach. And if his client starts testifying about other things being the cause of what happened here, it's all over. When we come back, we're going to talk about what happened today. A lot did, a lot of tears, but who had a better day? Was it the prosecution or defense? Our think tank will answer that question when we return. Could someone be stealing your identity or hacking into your phone or laptop? It can actually happen from across the room or from thousands of miles away. Or a company you trust with your personal information could be breached. Your information is in more places than ever. You need more protection than ever. That's why Norton and LifeLock are now part of one company, providing an all-in-one membership for your cyber safety. Norton 360 with LifeLock gives you identity theft protection, device security, a VPN for online privacy, and more. Cyber criminals keep looking for new ways to steal your personal information. You might not even know it until it's too late. Someone filed my taxes under my name, $6,000 was sent to some anonymous person, some anonymous bank account. They got into my bank account and my cell phone. What else do they have? With threats all around, you need 360 degree protection. Norton 360 with LifeLock gives you all-in-one protection against today's new threats. I've got two industry leaders coming together to help protect my identity and my devices. Why not have that added layer of protection so that you can sleep well at night? Join now and use promo code MYPROMO to save 25% off your first year. All Norton 360 with LifeLock memberships include LifeLock Identity Theft Protection, backed by our Million Dollar Protection Package, and U.S.-based restoration specialists who will work to fix problems. Award-winning Norton Device Security for multiple devices. A VPN for online privacy, securing your connections whether you're on public Wi-Fi or at home. And more. You never know where cyber threats are lurking these days. Don't wait to become a victim. Here's how to join. Norton 360 with LifeLock. Call 1-800-431-2264 or visit lifelock.com slash mypromo. Use promo code mypromo to save 25% off your first year and get a free shredder with annual membership. Call now. Furnace breakdown? Oh no! That could be a $3,300 bill you weren't expecting! Fridge on the fritz? Ah, oh, that could cost you $2,500! Burst pipe? That could be $1,100! But not if you have a home warranty plan from First American. With a First American home warranty plan, when a covered appliance or system breaks, call or click. That's it. And we'll repair or replace it for you. And for most covered repairs, all you pay is a small service fee. We have plans that cover air conditioning, most appliances, plus heating, plumbing, electrical systems, and much more. Plans start as low as $25 a month, and most come with a risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee. A leak came from the ceiling. We made a call to First American. All fixed. Everything they fixed has stayed fixed. Why let a major system or appliance breakdown 
bust your budget or go through the hassle of trying to find trustworthy service people. Get the First American Home Warranty Plan. And when a covered item breaks, call or click. That's it. And we'll repair or replace it for you. We're part of the First American family of companies, named one of the most trustworthy companies in America by Forbes magazine. Saved us thousands of dollars. Saved close to $7,000. So we're talking seven or $800. So we were stoked. <laughs> <laughs> Last year alone, we saved our customers over $140 million in repair and replacement costs. Don't wait until it's too late and you're stuck with a huge repair bill because your air conditioner, furnace, or fridge broke. I feel confident, I'm safe with them, and I know they have my back. If you don't have First American Warranty, get it. Call 1-800-685-4594 or visit protectmybudget.com for a free no-obligation quote. That's 1-800-685-4594. Or visit protectmybudget.com for a free, no obligation quote. Call now. Were there concerns addressed by Ms. Bowling as to her observations of the demeanor or the condition of the parents during this visitation? She was stated that the, she thought they was loopy, that Miss Groves was loopy. Okay. Did she further explain what, according to the records, what she meant by loopy? Of that she was uh, on drugs. So I'm trying to get at You were the only caseworker on this case, but you had not completed your training. Correct. Did you just walk in and have a seat on the couch? At first, but before I left, I got up, walked over, looked at him. I made three state, uh, two statements. I made, I wonder if he's going to have natural curly hair like his dad and